next 10 are pretty long and tough, so we're going on 31 here. So 31, we got a lot of stuff here. We've got coal hydroxide, it's dissolving a little bit. We have a KSP analysis. It gives us the KSP value up here, 5.9 times 10 to the negative 15. Because it goes to one ion and two ions, we end up with x times quantity 2x squared, or 4x cubed. And so we can solve for what x is, and x ends up coming out to be Uh, 1.14 times 10 to the negative fifth, but we want to know our hydroxide amount, and so we need to do 2x, which comes out to be 2.28 times 10 to the negative fifth. If we then take the negative log of that 2x, that gives us our pOH, and that comes out to be 5.64. Um, and then so our pH then would be complementary of that up to 14, which would be C, 9.36. You'll notice that B and D are both close because they're anticipating a lot of issues with forgetting that 2x and getting another answer. Okay, uh, number 32 is not terribly tricky. Uh, we're looking at calcium oxalate. So oxalate can, of course, form oxalic acid, and that's going to be aqueous. So if we can convert this from the ionic form where we have that very strong ionic interaction, to the acidic form, we're looking at getting better solubility. A very tiny amount will dissolve in pure H2O. Um, I don't know how these two amounts would compare. I would assume this one will make this a little more soluble, but probably be similar. Um, calcium is going to hurt our cause because it's gonna add calcium ions, which is gonna form a precipitate. Uh, but D, we're adding acid to it. That's gonna convert the calcium oxalate into oxalic acid. So D is our best choice there. Okay, 33 is quite a bit here, so I've set this up on the other board. So here's what we have going on. Move this background. So we have silver bromide uh, has a KSP value. It has silver uh, forming a complex ion, and it gives us the equilibrium constant for that. So the, what they're then asking is, what if we try and dissolve the solid using thiosulfate to form this complex ion? How will that go? So it turns out that if you look, these two add up to be this, which means that these two equilibrium constants will multiply to give us a new equilibrium constant. So since that equilibrium constant we know, we can do an ice chart for this, where we start with 0.2 molar of thiosulfate, we subtract 2x and end up with this. We start with zero of this, we start with zero of this, and we end up with x of this. So we have our equilibrium constant is equal to x times x, x squared, over 0.2 minus 2x, quantity squared because of that two, so we can then square root this and square root this to simplify this down into this, which we can then solve for x, and x ends up being 0 0.0886, and that x is going to be this value, and that value is going to be stoichiometrically proportional to this value, and so therefore that tells us how much silver bromide dissolves, so we can go back and we can select answer. Okay. That was quite a bit, but we'll move along. All right, 34, we have HF. HF is going to form H plus and F minus. We have differing amounts of both, and we have an equilibrium constant. So what I did for this was I just changed this into moles, and I changed this into moles. We'll get my values for that real quick. Okay. So the HF, I ended up with 0 0.015 moles. And I'm gonna use these in a nice chart because they're both gonna be divided by the same volume and they're later going to cancel that volume out. So I can just keep them as is. And then this ended up being 0 0.02875. And then this, I'm gonna assume it's zero, really it's 10 to the negative seven. Okay, so then this is going to decrease and we're gonna ignore the minus X, we end up with 0.015. This is going to increase, we're going to end up with an X, and this is going to increase as well, but we're going to ignore that because those changes are going to be so much smaller relative to those two values. We can then plug in our K is equal to our H plus, which is X, times our 0.02875 relative to our 0.015. So keep in mind here, normally to change this into concentration, I would have divided both of those by the total volume of solution. I'm doing that here and here, I don't have to do it. So I can take this and I can plug in the Ka now, 6.8 times 10 to the fourth, and solve for x. And when I solve for that x, I get 3.5 times 10 to the fourth. 
and that ends up taking a negative log to be 3.45, which is D. Okay. 35, here we have graph of natural log of K versus 1 over T is linear and has a positive slope. So that gives us information about our enthalpy. So positive slope, we know the slope is equal to negative delta H over R. So if the slope is positive, that would imply that the delta H is also positive. And the first one says that the delta H is negative, so we know that that's incorrect. The second part says that we know that delta S is positive. So since we know this, we might be able to infer some information about this, but we don't know what the delta G is. And so that limits, because we don't know what our equilibrium constant is of anywhere, we don't know whether this is spontaneous or not, so we really can't gather any information about that. And then we're looking at D being the best choice. Okay, this one is a very tricky question. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble working this out, but I think we are there now. So when we're looking at this analysis, because we have two molecules of gas on each side, Kp and Kc will be equivalent. So we can automatically change from Kp into Kc. So the Kc is going to be 50.4. And then what I did from there was I set up a nice chart. We started with 0.0167 of each of these. We subtract x from each and end up with 0.0167 molar for both gases. Here we start with 0 and we add 2x and we end up with 2x. So we can then plug into a k expression and we can say that 50.4 is equal to quantity 2x squared over quantity 0.0167 minus x times itself squared. So I can square root this side, I can square root this side, and simplify that down a little bit. Um, when I do that, what I end up finding is that x is equal to 0.013, which is one of the choices. But if you look, they're asking for how many moles of H I are present. So I have to look at the fact that that's 2x. So I double 0.013, which is 0 0.0260, but it also asks for moles and not concentration. So currently, since I have this in molarity, I'm going to have to reapply the three liters. I'm going to have to triple that value, which gives us D. So that was tricky. I caught this one, but I failed to see that I still had it in concentration instead of moles as I quickly worked through a hard test. I missed that. Okay, so here we're going to do a balancing reaction for our redox reaction. Um, I think we've got plenty of room here. So we're going to take iodide and iodite. And we're doing this in basic solution, which is why we have MnO2 as a product instead of, say, MnO2+. Plus. So we have hydroxide, water, and electrons available to balance these things. But the best way to do this is to just balance it in acidic and then later neutralize all of your acid. So quickly, we're going to go through and add a water here. We're going to add two H pluses here. And we have a negative charge, a negative charge, and two positives, so we'll need two electrons to get that. Then, on our other reaction, we have MnO4 minus turning into MnO2. So we need two more oxygens, so we'll need two waters. That's four hydrogens, so we'll need four H pluses. And our electron total, we have a minus and four pluses, so we'll need three electrons here. So we're good, we've got electrons on both sides. Then we're going to go ahead and combine everything. So we're going to triple this, and we're going to double this in order to get that to work. And so we're going to go ahead and combine those, and that gives us this reaction, which is three water plus eight H plus plus two for manganese plus three iodide. some progress on this and now the last thing we need to do is kind of make this all work out. So we're going to start by canceling some things. We have six H pluses here. Let's get rid of those. And that's going to take us down to two on this side. And then over here we've got three waters. 
Whereas on here we have a single water left after we get rid of three of those four. Then we need to get rid of this because we're in basin. So we're going to add two hydroxides here. And we're going to add two hydroxides here. So adding hydroxides to both sides will take you from acidic to basic. These then change to become two waters, which then cancels out this and cancels out one of those. So we end up with a water plus two permanganates plus three iodides, and three hypoiodides, two MnO2s, and two hydroxides. So there's our balanced reaction. It says, what's the ratio of hydroxide to iodide? We have two to three. And so D is our choice, and D is the correct answer. Okay, a relatively simple question for once. Uh, here we have a plus one. These are all neutral, and so therefore the vanadium should be minus one. And so even though perhaps we're uncomfortable because of the difficulty of the test, we can go ahead and put minus one in and move along. Okay, so this one's a little tough, so I'm going to actually pull back over to this board again. So here we have this reaction going on, and it has a voltage. This reaction going on, and it gives us a voltage. It's asking us for what's the equilibrium constant for this reaction. Now, this reaction can be formed by taking reaction two and then the reverse of reaction one. When we take the reverse of reaction one, we're, of course, going to change this to a positive 0.44 volts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use delta G equals negative NF E naught to go ahead and do some figuring on what these values are. So delta G1 is going to be negative two times various constant 96,500 times a positive 0.44 volts. And that comes out to be negative 84,920. Our second delta G, delta G2, is going to be a negative times 2 times 96,500 times a negative 0.89 volts. And that one comes out to be a positive 171,000. 770. So then delta G3 is just a combination between the two. So we would just add those two together and we're going to end up with a positive 86,850. Uh, I think we are in joules per mole. Oh. So from there, what we then want to do is we want to figure out what the equilibrium constant is. So to do that, we're going to do natural log of the equilibrium constant is equal to negative delta G over RT. And for that, we're going to plug in our negative 86,850 over 8.304. And our temperature, which I believe is 298. Yep, 298. So we go ahead and plug all this in, and when we do e to that power, we get our equilibrium constant to be 6 times 10 to the negative 16th. And from all of that, we can go through and figure out that our choice is B. Okay. And our last one for this set of lengthy hard questions is number 40. This one was particularly challenging. So this is a good one where I can give you kind of some advice on how to roll this. So what I did for this was I started by figuring out how many moles of electrons do I have. So I know I have 0 0.150 coulombs per second times 1,429 seconds. So amps is coulombs per second. So I can figure out my total charge. Um, and that ended up being about 214 and change coulombs. And then what I did was I divided that by 96,500 which is how many coulombs there are per mole of electron to get the number of moles of electrons. So that was 0 0.00222 moles of electrons. So then I went around and kind of futzed around for a little bit with some of these numbers, trying to figure out a way to mathematically do this. What I ended up doing eventually that was the fastest was to just guess one of the answers that's in the middle here and then go through and do the analysis. Uh, there's probably a way to do it, but I didn't I really have the time to figure that out on a multiple choice test. So I guessed C, C was incorrect, and then I moved to D, which ended up being the correct answer. So let me walk you through how that would look. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take 58.3% of a one gram sample and say that that's the amount of copper. So that means that I'm gonna have 0 0.0583 moles, I'm sorry, not moles, grams of copper uh, in the thing. And I'm gonna figure out how many moles that is. 
So I have the 0.0583 grams of copper. I'm going to go ahead and change that to moles. So that ends up being 0.000918 moles of copper. Now, to get that many moles of copper into copper 2 plus, I'm going to require twice as many moles of electrons to be transferred. And so what that means is that I'm going to need double that to get the moles of electrons. So I'm going to double that, and that's going to give me my moles of electrons, which is going to come out to just under 0.002. So I get 0 0.00184 for that. Now, for the leftover, I'm going to be looking at how much of this is silver. So for that, I have 0 0.0417 grams of silver. And when I figure out that as moles, that comes up to 0 0.00039 moles of silver. Now, because silver is a plus one charge, that means that I'm going to have exactly that many moles of electrons in order to create that much silver. So when I combine those two amounts, those add up to be 0 0.00222 moles of electrons, which indicates that B is the answer choice that fits into our data.